Watch this. A bill that would ban transgender affirmation surgery for youth generated emotional public testimony today. One family says they're concerned about the health and safety of their 15-year-old transgender daughter. Candidates for the 2022 election are beginning to officially file their run for office. There's exactly one week left for candidates to join the race. We're taking a look at how the few major statewide races look like right now. And we're answering your big questions of the week, like what is this contraption on Chairman Close's desk in House Education? And why does he have it? The 208 starts now. Well, happy Friday, and thank you so much for joining us here on the 208. Let's begin in our favorite place, the state capitol in downtown Boise. Specifically, we're going to talk about the House State Affairs Committee and the strong testimony they heard today on House Bill 675. Now, that's the bill that bans transgender affirmation surgery for anyone under the age of 18. It also prevents people under the age of 18 from receiving puberty blockers and other hormone medications for the purpose of a gender transition. The legislation says that a person knowingly caught providing a surgery or medication for someone under 18 could face a felony here in the state of Idaho. And we bring in now our Andrew Bartline. Andrew, I know you were down at the Capitol all day talking with lawmakers as well as Idahoans about the legislation itself, what it does, but also the impact that it could have on some Idaho families. And we'll start with this. What was really the back and forth down there? Well, a lot of people that supported this legislation, their argument is that these kids aren't old enough to make this decision for themselves. But we cut up with a Boise family there, the Thompsons, and they strongly opposed the bill. Their kid missed school. The parents missed work. They came down to give their testimony to speak against it. It mattered that much to them because their 15-year-old daughter, Lynn, is transgender. Lynn's biggest problem with this bill is that the treatment and affirmation surgery are treated the exact same. The Thompsons actually seem to understand the surgery aspect of the bill. While they may not like it, they agree surgery is a big decision, and it's one that Lynn is not ready for yet, which the intention of the bill, according to bill sponsor Representative Bruce Scogg, is to stop children from making an irreversible life decision that they're not ready for. But the Thompsons say hormones and blockers have been very beneficial for their daughter Lynn, and Lynn didn't get the chance to testify as time ran out today, so she shared her testimony with us. After feeling initially comforted in a sense of belonging when I found out about the trans community, I would deny being trans myself throughout middle school. During this time, the feelings went from crying about not being born a girl to a genuine hatred of my body. I hated my name and I hated being called he. When it got bad enough, I was forced to confront the feelings and question if I was trans. After months, I concluded I am. I didn't want to be, I'd prefer not to be, but I am. We spoke to doctors and went to experts and I got the counseling <clears throat> and I got counseling before we could get the care I needed. In my opinion, I think the counseling was necessary. I think you should be sure before you start blockers, but you can be sure of this well before you turn 18. I do not regret my transition, only how long it took me to realize, come out, and start blockers. I got lucky to have access to trans care and have a supportive family and friends. I do not believe I would be alive without it. Representative Bruce Gogg told us in an email he had a packed schedule. We were unable to speak with him today, but from the committee meeting today, he says that this bill is to protect children. Scog says going on hormones, blockers, or getting a surgery. Again, those two are too big of a decision for children to make. Again, his words. Scog says children can't vote, they can't drink, they can't get a tattoo. Why would we allow them to make this decision? Uh, the decision that Scog says they may regret later in life. And now here's Scog in committee, and we also hear testimony from a supporter of the bill who says he was formerly transgender himself. So how should children be treated that have gender confusion or dysphoria? Well, the old-fashioned psychology way, counseling and talk therapy. This is not a bill to take away treatment for these children that have gender dysphoria. It's a bill to get proper treatment and to prevent them from lifelong permanent decisions that will make them sterile and uh, mutilate their bodies. I had additional feminization surgeries, but no matter how many I had, every time I looked in the mirror, I saw a man staring back at me. I tried hard to resolve the conflict, but I couldn't. The bottom line is that the therapist and the medical community was wrong in my case. Now, this bill did get through committee. It only received pushback from the two Democrats on that committee. That would be Representative Gannon and Mathis. Joe? Well, I'm curious, Andrew. It looked like there was a pretty packed room. There's a lot of attention on this at the State House today. I saw a lot of traffic on social media talking about it, but what was it like down at the Capitol? Uh, it sounds like there was a group outside. I don't know if protest was the right word, but there was a group getting together, having flags, you know, showing signs to um, oppose against uh, this piece of legislation. But it wasn't on the steps when we got down there. We didn't see a whole lot of it. We kind of show up a little bit toward the end. 
Seems though from the emotional testimony today that we'll be seeing a lot more of this next week. Again, as Andrew mentioned, this House uh, committee passed it onto the full House, so we'll keep track of it next week. Thank you very much, Andrew, for joining us here on the 208. Well, we are heading into a major election season coming up in early May. Idahoans will vote in the primary elections, and these are the inter-party races that will determine who goes on to the November general election ballot. And in such a heavily Republican state, that's the truth here, a lot of races coming up in May are the most important of the year because the likelihood of who wins in May, well, the Republicans a lot of times are going to win in November as well. It's the plain truth here. Now, this week, the official filing period began for candidates to officially enter their races across the state. And candidates, they have until next Friday at 5 p.m. to jump into the race. It's the official cutoff, and we'll be here right at 5 to tell you who's in the race. But there are a lot of missing names right now if you look at the list. But we are going to take a look at some of the major statewide races and who is officially in. Again, these are primary. So independent candidates will not appear until the November ballot. But this is the current look at the race for Idaho governor. Um, likely not a lot of household names there. If you go on to the second race here, the race for lieutenant governor, news today, Republican Scott Betke, he is jumping in the race. Again, this is a real limited list of candidates so far. We're expecting to see a lot more next week, especially in the governor's race and in the lieutenant governor's race. So a real slim list right now, but you can see a Republican, Democrat, and someone from the Constitutional Party there as well. Well, let's take a look at the race for Secretary of State, and we'll show you there. It's just Representative Dorothy Moon, a Republican from the Stanley area. We're expecting several other names to populate this list, but for now, though, if the election was today, Dorothy Moon would be the only one registered. Again, they have till 5 p.m. next Friday to get on the ballot. And let's take a look at the Attorney General's race here. Again, this is the May primary. These are all the Republicans that are in the race. No Democrats have filed for the primary as our last check, but you'll maybe see see some names there that you recognize. Representative Raul Rab Labrador, I should say. He used to be a congressman for the state of Idaho. And if we go on to the superintendent of public instruction, some big names there, Brandon Durst and the incumbent superintendent, Sherry Ibarra. Again, we are expecting a lot more candidates to file over the next week, but we see a lot of questions from you at home in Zip Whip asking us about who's in the races. So that's who's in the race right now. Again, a lot to do. More candidates will jump in soon. We'll keep you posted. But if you're interested, you can keep track of all this yourself online right now, ktvb.com. And a happy Idaho Day to all of you out there. If you didn't know, today, March 4th, is Idaho Day. And in 2014, then-Governor Bush Otter signed into law House Bill 378, and that created an annual celebration in recognition of the Gem State's history and future. And other people weighing in on social media today about the history of Idaho. Of course, Senator Jim Risch, he tweeted, this collage is some of Idaho's beautiful scenes in recognition of Idaho, the city of Boise looking down Capitol Boulevard, Shoshone Falls, and a shot of our scenic mountains there. Some classic shots from Senator Risch. Also, Senator Mike Crapo in on Twitter tweeted these pictures of the congressional documents that President Abraham Lincoln signed in 1863 that made Idaho a territory of the United States of America. And in a little less than an hour, the Idaho State Historical Society, they're hosting a virtual celebration of the 8th annual Idaho Day, and they're going to have a big conversation about Idaho's rich mining history, something that really set up the state of Idaho for success. We're going to have some information and links for you on their website at the Idaho State Historical Society website. Uh, so that'll be at 6 o'clock, so you want to get in right now if you're interested in the event. But a happy Idaho Day to all. And my big question is, similar to Christmas, I wonder if Spuddy Buddy will be by with gifts. It's Friday, and that means we're taking a look back. Wednesday, we brought you a story about a new program at Boise State to recycle those Orange Bank products. And you had some questions, so we got the answers. Before we get to that, let's make sure we get to this. Send us a text message with your comments, questions, really anything. Send it to the number on our screen. You know the number, 208-321-5614. Please be sure to include your name and hashtag the 208. We're going to share some of your comments live on screen at the end of the show, so stay tuned.
Well, it's Friday, and that means we are taking a look at the major stories of the week and the questions that you had. And on Wednesday, we brought you a story about a program at Boise State to recycle those orange bag products. And you had a lot of questions. We did, too. So we went and got some answers. But before we get to the questions, let's all get on the same page here. And you can always, of course, send us text message with your comments or your questions. The number on your screen, 208-321-5614. But we are going to take a look now at a story from our Katya Stepovic. Yeah, we're not, we're not uh, limited by the amount of plastic trash we have at the wow. moment. Scott Phillips, professor of material science and engineering at Boise State, is no stranger to these orange bags that come from residents across the Treasure Valley to his experimental lab. And what do they do with them? We take the orange bags and, and we're purposely um, not taking anything out of them, meaning we use everything that's in the orange bag. And, and so we combine all of that together. And when it's full, we end up with shreds that look like this. Mm -hmm. right, so we have buckets of this now. And for lab testing, uh, we put it into molds, actually, like this one. The two big metal pieces are both hot. Mm -hmm. And then, um, then we put some pressure on it, and it compresses everything down while it heats up the plastic. Then you end up with a square like this. <laughs> Not much happens with them after that for now at least. What I would love is to make boards, right? so make different types of boards, give them to um, construction management students who like to build things and, uh, and have them build things like trash cans on campus, benches on campus. I think dorm room furniture could be made from, from these kinds of things. At the end of the day, if, when they're no longer needed, we can shred them back up and put them right back in the process. And that's not the only experiment cooking up on floor two in the Micron Center for Material Research Building. They're also experimenting with creating their own kind of plastics that can be used over and over again without deteriorating or adding more materials, becoming 100% recyclable in a method that uses low energy. So how does it work? We're actually looking at um, abundant natural compounds as the starting materials. Uh, ones that are used in food industry a lot and in the fragrance industry, so they're, they're non-toxic to begin with. And then through a cooling method. We're making polymers in that cold area in there. And, um, and ultimately we, you know, we make enough of them that you get a solid out of that. And then you get material like this, some flexible and some are harder forms of plastic. Um, so these aren't beautiful, but they're, you know, it's on the way. Oh. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> this one is a brittle one. Right. Sorry. Um, and that's what we're trying to figure out. And in their third experiment going on, Phillips and his students use another natural resource to make a different kind of plastic. We're saying, can we replace certain types of plastics with a new composite material that we're making with sugar as the, the core to it? That's right, sugar, which is of ample supply in Idaho. This is made with sugar. sugar. Yeah. Sugar and wow. then and some different additives. These materials can be made into anything from chess pieces to plastic cups, forks, and knives that you can recycle or throw in your compost. And this can all be recycled. And this you can just stick in the ground if you want. Yeah. <laughs> right? wow. it's, it's just you know just it's natural stuff and it, it just gets decomposed. It turns out we also can recycle it. Um, so if we were to just grind this up, we could put it right back in the process. The experiments have been tweaked over the years, and now Phillips and his students are eager to scale this up to mass production as the concern over plastic waste grows. Um, so while I don't think that any one of these products is going to be the end-all be-all solution to all of our plastics problems, it's fascinating to see um, j just the diverse amount of solutions that are out there, and I think that we can be a big part of that. What we're trying to replace is all types of plastic with these recycling plastics and so I see a future where um, we just we have one type of plastic that has a lot of different uses that is easily recyclable. Philip says some of these low energy processes are ready to be taken to the next level. We have reached that point now where you know we've sorted out the fundamental features and sorted out the science of how to do it and, and so now it's, it's time to scale up. Right now, a majority of the orange bags are still being sent to a company in Utah to be used as fuel for concrete manufacturing, but Boise State is going to experiment with low energy ways to recycle the bags collected here in the Treasure Valley. And we had a couple of questions sent to us about the program, like this one was asks, if the department wants more orange bags, how can we help them and give them our full bags? Popular question. Well. 
We reached out and Professor Phillips says right now the university does not have the space for a location to collect and hold the plastics. They are currently though partnering with Western Recycling to get the material when they need it. A low pressure center is bringing moisture to lots of parts of the southwest right now. You can see it's very scattered in nature. There's not really any one particular area that's just seeing a downpour. These are really lighter showers, uh, very light sprinkles for some areas, but really widespread, not anything too confined. And that's similar to what we're seeing in our area right now too. We're seeing some showers in the Twin Falls area, even though it may feel like it's about to rain in Boise with the clouds that we're seeing and the winds picking up, but we're gonna largely miss a lot of that moisture. You can see some of that streaming in and being blocked by the mountains. So we may still, we can't rule out chances of showers, but we will see some sprinkles perhaps in parts of the valley. Looking ahead into tomorrow, we're gonna see a lot of that moisture kind of linger. Again, much of the moisture is confined to the Magic Valley area. And as we look forward into tomorrow, the, lots of those clouds are clearing out, uh, but we can't rule out those scattered showers. They kind of stay in play for the rest of the weekend, the clouds and the wind as well. But, but by Sunday, much of that is cleared out. If we look just at snow, just for the snow for the mountains, you can see mainly confined to the central portions of the state with just a few inches and in for tomorrow. We did see a big drop in temperatures with those with the cold front that moved through Twin Falls, seeing the biggest drop at almost 20 degrees. The winds will pick up tomorrow. We're a little bit breezy right now, but they will calm into tomorrow and then pick up again tomorrow afternoon around six at 23 miles an hour. So tomorrow we can expect those windy conditions, some clouds, and we will see a gentle roller coaster as we we go out through the next 10 days of our high temperatures. Pretty normal for this time of year, not anything too severe, but the low temperatures will be staying below freezing for 
earlier parts of the week. But for tomorrow, mainly we're worrying about those winds and chances of showers, but not too much, Joe. Well, Sophia, I got my eye on the extended forecast. I saw close to 60 degrees a week from Monday. So fingers crossed, right? Almost fingers here. Crossed. Yes. Almost Spring here. All right. Great. Sophia Bliss joining us on the 208. Sophia, thank you. Well, here on the 208, we love to answer viewer questions. And this week, a few eagle eyed viewers had a question about an object on a desk in the House Education Committee. Let's take a look. Carrie sent us this picture of the 208 broadcast from this past week, drawing attention to what like a, a toy or a puzzle, some contraption. It wasn't a one off either. This colorful contraption could be seen on the chairman's desk every day in House Education. So what's the story behind it? Well, we thought we'd let House Education Committee Chairman Lance Cloud tell us himself. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the House Education Committee. It's, to some people, it's a toy, and I and uh, I need to tell you the whole story. Is back in uh, 2019 when I was appointed chairman of the House Education Committee, um, I was provided this gavel. Okay, and actually, it's not really very big, but it, you know, it turns out I, I can hold it way back. It looks very small, but I was provided this gavel. And never thought much of it, you know, it wasn't very big, but that's what I use. And they give you a little plate to pound on. And then we had a joint committee in the Senate. And uh, at that time, Chairman Mortimer was over there and he was, uh, he led that meeting uh, and he pulls out what looks like a sledgehammer of a gavel. And, uh, you know, I mean, it, it had to be, you know, compared to mine, it had to be about that big around compared to mine. I was looking at this as well. How can Senate spend so much money on a gavel and over in the House? Of course, we're more conservative in the House, I guess. But, you know, so I looked at it and I set it down next to his gavel and it was kind of like, wow, you know, I, I'm, but anyway, so I immediately started thinking, well, maybe I better get a better, a better gavel. So um, I started thinking about the gavel and how much it was going to cost and should I buy it? Should the state be buying it? And I realized that it's perfect for a cobbler's bench. So this is the toy you're referencing. And I figured I'm in the House Education Committee and you know we start with early learning all the way to uh, universities, higher education. And I thought, well, why not just put a cobbler's bench out there and I can hit the green ones for starting a meeting and the red ones for the end of a meeting. And <clears throat> it was mostly envious that I, I was embarrassed at how small my gavel was, but now you can see it's almost perfect size to a cobbler's bench. And so I was able to go to the local toy, toy store and buy this old cobbler's bench, I think for like $9, and I've been using it ever since. So with that, the meeting is adjourned. I, you know, maybe it's a little silly, but to me, I just thought, well, you know, teachers will respect the idea. People come in there and, and they might ask, what's that for? And, you know, it's, it, this is the education committee. <laughs>
Let's put this week to bed with some of your comments, and this is a good one. Uh, Debbie Critchfield, question mark, superintendent of public schools candidate. I think she has filed Jody and Meridian. I was just checking in the commercial, Jody. Um, we know that Debbie Critchfield, she intends on running. We know she's going to be in the race, but she's not technically filed as of 1.46 p.m. That's the last update in the official Secretary of State update. So it's possible she walked down there at 4.30 and turned her documents in, and it hasn't been updated in the portal. So we'll keep everyone posted. But next Friday at 5.00 o'clock tune in here we'll have the official list uh, this person says happy friday hashtag 208 enjoy your weekend jeremy yes uh everybody get out there enjoy the weekend it's been a little bit nicer out there lately and i've seen people on the green belts a little extra smiles out there so yes thank you for the nice message there jeremy and we got one more here this person says why is our legislature etc trying to dictate a personal private choice i get the religious leaning but my choice debbie and we've seen a few comments come into our newsroom over the last week uh, some of you asking us to take a look at the separation between church and state and really if it's more of a formality if it's more of a tradition so something we're going to jump into here on the 208 in the coming weeks and i also i just saw we don't have time to get up on screen but i got a few comments in on on the text messages from you about the piece we just ran running into the commercial break with representative clow and his his action there his his special tool there at the front of the house education committee it's always easy to forget these are regular people down there at the state house and they like to have a little bit of fun in between the lines too but anyways hope everyone else has some fun in between the lines this weekend we'll see you on monday